apologize to those who are, who are finishing davening with the vision to start the program. Our annual uh, Three Thanksgiving Sudas Hodaya, which this year is sponsored by Mr. Mayor Grossman, in memory of his father, Menachem Grossman, Tachona Lebracha, the grandfather of Ricky. We're privileged to hear today from Rabbi Rothwatz, who will share some words of inspiration before our Suda. Rabbi Rothwatz is the Rav of Beth Aaron and a Rebbe at YNJ. Um, and he'll be speaking about he'll be speaking about the topic of 21st century heroes, real and, and imagined. What kidney donation can teach us about life? Rabbi Rothwax is one of the preeminent Torah personalities of our community, who always brings a Torah perspective of compassion and insight into all topics, and who also has a unique perspective on this issue due to his own experience as a kidney donor. We're really privileged to hear from him, and I know that we're all in for a treat. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that uh, wonderful introduction. Just Mrs. Kahan, Rabbi Prince, all the other uh, teachers and students. Really is a, um, a personal privilege to have this opportunity. Uh, it's a little daunting knowing that I'm the only thing between you and the meal, the big feast. So I'll try to, uh, I'll try to make the time go as quickly as possible. Uh, here's what I plan on doing. I plan on uh, spending much of the time talking. And I hope it will not be boring. I hope it will be of interest to you. I'm pretty uh, savvy at being able to tell whether or not uh, my audience is bored. And if I feel that you are, so I'll cut my remarks short. But otherwise, I'm going to speak for a while. And then I would love to offer you the opportunity uh, to ask any questions that you have. So you may have questions that come to your mind uh, you know, in the course of uh, my remarks. Or maybe you'll have uh, some thoughts afterwards. And feel free. Uh, to hold your questions, and like I said, I'd be honored if you uh, would want to ask anything, uh, and I'm certainly happy to uh, answer any of your questions at that time. So first of all, I, I want to say that this is actually the first, maybe even less, I don't know, but the first time that I'm, I'm speaking about my own personal experience as a kidney donor publicly. I've never had uh, the opportunity to do so. I shared several remarks with my shul uh, a few weeks after my recovery, but other than that, uh, this is really uh, my first opportunity, and therefore it feels a little strange. It feels a little strange because the entire experience on a certain level is very personal, uh, yet I feel you know, comfortable with this audience, and I hope that uh, you'll appreciate that rem my remarks really do feel personal in that way. It's a little strange for me to speak about kidney donation because one year ago I literally knew nothing about the topic of kidney donation. When I say I know nothing, it doesn't mean that I didn't know what the term kidney donation meant. I had actually given at least twice in the past shiurim on the topic, talking about whether or not a person is permitted, whether it's a mitzvah, when, whether cases can be made that a person is obligated to donate a kidney. But that's pretty much it. It, it was very uh, external. It was sort of, you know, very impersonal for me. And I certainly had never given the thought uh, at any point in my life whatsoever that I would give a kidney. So when I say a year ago, I mean literally a year ago. I don't remember the date, but I think it was um, sometime in the month of December, so I'm approaching about a year, I got a call from somebody who's an old friend. Uh, he grew up in Teaneck. Uh, he was uh, a member of the Teaneck community for many years. He no longer lives in Teaneck. And he called me because he was informing me that his brother was in need of a kidney. Um, and he was calling me as he was calling other rabbis in town to find out whether or not our shul uh, could host the program. And the purpose of this program would be twofold. Number one, to raise awareness regarding the importance of kidney donation in general. And at the same time, you know, to see whether or not there are any potential do donors in our community who would be interested in being screened uh, to donate to uh, his brother. So needless to say, I, I was more than happy to accommodate him. Um, I believe within a day or two we actually had selected a date and scheduled that the organization is known as Renewal, that facilitates kidney donations within the community, would actually come to my shul and present, and there would be a lecture on the topic, and a question and answer, and an oneg, maybe a video. It's a great a whole weekend devoted to this topic. And then he asked one more favor of me. He didn't ask me for my kidney. He asked me one more favor. He said, if you don't mind, we would like it if the rabbi would speak about the topic from the pulpit on Shabbos morning. That's part of what Renewal likes, that the host rabbi, whichever shul this event is being held in, will speak about kidney donation. 
So th I'll tell you the truth. I don't know how it works in your shul, but in my shul, very rarely am I told what to speak about on any given Shabbos. Sometimes I would love it if somebody would say, hey, why don't you speak about this, that. It's usually up to me to decide what I want to talk about. This particular week, they wanted me to speak about it. So I said, okay, no problem. I still had a couple of weeks to go, maybe even a month or two. That gave me more than enough time to think about this topic that I had never really spoken about before. Again, this was not a sheer. This is just to give a drusha, a sermon, perhaps an inspiring thought, which would plant seeds in the minds of people as to why maybe, maybe, maybe they would want, want to be considered uh, as, a, as a donor. So, as we got closer, and I gave it a little more thought, I realized that this was an uncomfortable thing for me, because I was being asked to speak in front of my shul, many hundreds of people, about something that I myself would never do. And so that put me in some, somewhat of an awkward position. I've joked uh, with some close friends since that if you want to really, really know where Larry Rothwack struggles most, then you should come to my shul and listen to my speeches every week. And over the course of many weeks and months, you'll realize that there are certain things I never talk about. And those are the things that I struggle with. Because I have a very difficult time giving and getting up and speaking to people and giving them muster about something that I myself struggle with. Sometimes I have to, but generally speaking, I try to, as they say, practice what I preach. And over here, I was being asked to pre preach about something that I would never practice. So I needed to formulate in my mind an argument first for myself, and then maybe I would have to actually articulate to the members of the community why I would never do this, but I think this is something that you should consider. So in my mind, there were several obvious questions. And I'm actually going to read just several sentences from you, because I had... I had composed an article, it was published in the link, this is close to a year ago, after the donation, and I, I, it's my own words, but you know, rather than, than sort of recreate it uh, by memory, I'm, I'm just going to read to you uh, several sentences. These were some of the questions that I had thought, not necessarily initially, but the more I thought about it. How can I, a help, husband of a selfless and devoted wife, give away a vital organ that I myself may possibly need in the future? How could I, a loving and proud father of five beautiful children, and please God, one day, grandchildren diminish my own biological resources, possibly jeopardizing my own health, if not short-term, then long-term. How could I, a teacher of many open and impressionable, impressionable young minds and souls, act in a way that recklessly models myopic judgment and displays a lack of regard for the most precious gift in the world, my health? How could I, a man over 40 years old, whose time is already stretched thin, with a schedule, a fixed routine, prepared meals, etc., effectively introduce the many lifestyle changes that one would expect to be necessary to accommodate such an extreme anatomical disruption. <coughs> and finally, how could I, a mere mortal, completely dependent upon the infinite kindness of the Creator, surrender a part of my body, a part of my anatomy, that was purposely divined with absolute perfection and gifted to me with divine wisdom? So these are some of the questions, like I said, that I needed to work through on my own before I was going to stand in front of many people and tell them why they should consider donating a kidney. Well, as I, I imagine, you probably can guess by now, that what I was shocked to discover was that as I worked through each and every one of these problems, and most of, the, so, most of it was not soul searching, it was just fact finding and research, so what I discovered was that in many ways, uh, the, the, the questions were better than the answers, and I found that the answers that I discovered were very compelling, um, to the point where ultimately uh, I, I could not really formulate, articulate for myself, a good reason why this wasn't right for me, why this is something that I uh, would not consider. Now, I don't know if this is going to disappoint you or not, but I, I do not intend to answer those questions here. In fact, uh, Neder, I, I don't think that I would ever make a public uh, presentation of this nature where I would tell you why I think you don't need to be concerned about ABCDEFG. I think it's presumptuous of me, I'm not a doctor, uh, I'm not uh, qualified to uh, speak really in any authoritative way on these issues, and therefore, you know, it, it's not my place to go ahead and tell you why I felt comfortable proceeding despite those very serious reservations that I had. I do feel, and you can hear me say this more than once today, regarding kidney donation, I do not feel that anybody should ever be compelled to donate a kidney. I don't think that anybody should ever feel any sense of pressure whatsoever from anyone, whether that person donated or not. But I do think that people should learn about it. And not necessarily every person in this room at this stage in your life, but I think it's important to be informed and to understand why it is that it is right for some 
and not right for others. That's sort of my, my, my message. But I'm, I'm not going to answer all these questions. But like I said, for myself, I was satisfied. So this was now about two or three weeks before this event was scheduled to happen in my shul. And now suddenly, this shift in my mind. Suddenly I was at the point where I, I think I'm going to consider doing this myself. So at this point, I decided that, obviously before proceeding, I would need to speak to two individuals. Anyone want to guess who they were? It's not Shira. Sorry. I had to speak to two individuals. First, I had to speak, of course, to my wife. And I asked her uh, her permission, and I asked for her consent and her blessings, and I spoke to my Rebbe. And I'm going to tell you, remarkably, although maybe not surprisingly, it certainly doesn't surprise me, but it was fascinating. Both of them separately gave me the same answer, and that is, you have my full support, you have my full blessing. Yes, 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 on one condition. And that is, well, my wife said on the condition that your Rebbe says it's okay. My Rebbe said on the condition that your wife says it's okay. So everyone was okay, but it had to be, you know, th this is not just my kidney. It's my wife's kidney as well, when you think about it. And so therefore, you know, there needs to be complete acceptance. Again, at this point, I was just looking for permission to proceed with the screening. This doesn't mean I'm ultimately going to be uh, accepted as, as, a, as a kidney donor. Um, the process of screening what involved an entire battery of tests. Uh, many different tests of details don't make a difference at the moment, but suffice it to say that um, I say this with, with tremendous Akar Satov, it's Arab Thanksgiving, I know that this is all about Suda Salda. Um, I've been blessed with good health. Uh, there are certain tests that are done routinely when you go for a checkup and other ones that they don't do. Uh, it's very unusual for a person who's in good health to have a CAT scan of their entire abdominal system to make sure that everything is in working order and everything is aligned and working the way it should be. I never had that done in my life. And now in order to be, uh, in order to be given a green light to donate a kidney, so the law requires that you're, cons that you're found to be in good enough health to be able to do that. And so there was an entire battery of tests, and one after another after another came back and I was given the all clear. Uh, a simple blood test was done to determine whether or not I could be a match for this individual, and I was cleared as well. And the rest happened very quickly. Uh, I'm going to tell you very interestingly, one of, the, uh, one of the stages of clearance that needs to happen is you need to be screened first by a uh, social worker and then by a psychiatrist. Uh, they are trying to make sure, you forgive me, that I'm um, not crazy. Uh, why would I be crazy? Why, why would I be crazy? I'm a nice guy. There's a lot of nice people here. So whenever this person comes forward in this country and says, I want to donate a kidney, uh, certainly if it's what's called an altruistic donation, which means it's not for a family member, they're trying to make sure that maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm having like suicidal thoughts. Maybe I want to like do something really crazy. Maybe somebody's paying me money because it's against the law in this country to receive any um, gift, any money, anything to donate. So what's going on over here? Why would you want to do this? And actually, I found that to be the most challenging part because I was being um, poked around, so to speak, not literally, but in my head and being asked these very, very personal intrusive questions as they were trying to see whether or not um, I, was, I was healthy and stable to be able to go ahead and consent to this. Um, I was able to fool them so they actually thought that I was healthy enough in my mind, so I was able to go ahead. Um, until this point, I had not had any conversations with the uh, prospective recipient, the one for whom I was uh, being screened. Um, the decision was more or less that I was not going to meet him officially before the surgery. Um, as fate or as destiny would have it, however, several days beforehand I had to go back into the hospital for one final test that they needed to do beforehand to make sure that it was clear for surgery. And as it just so happened, uh, he was sitting there as well. And I happened to know what he looked like. Um, I had met him many, many years earlier. Um, I would say probably 25 or 30 years earlier. I recognized his mother as well, who was sitting with him in the, in the uh, waiting room. And uh, for the first time since I had embarked on this journey, I became very, very emotional. Uh, until that point, I had not really, I hadn't shed a tear. I had not been very emotional about it. Um, and suddenly, I was just overwhelmed with this uh, tremendous, tremendous feeling of, uh, I didn't know what. It, it, it made it so real. Uh, I introduced myself to him. Um, as you may know, I'll speak about this in a few minutes as well, uh, the individual who received uh, the kidney that I donated has special needs. Uh, he, you're able to have a conversation with him. He's a very personable fellow. He's a very nice guy. Uh, but his you know, you know, cognitive um, abilities are limited. 
And so therefore he said to me, um, he said, what are you doing here? So I said, well, I'm here, I'm, I'm here because I hope to be donating a kidney soon. He says, guess what? I'm getting a kidney soon. So I said, that's great. I said, guess what? I'm going to give you hopefully my kidney. So he looked at me um, with, you know, a bit of surprise and he said, well then, who's going to give you a kidney? So I said, that's the best part. I actually have two. So I'm, I'm sure, and I'm sure he probably heard this before, but as it was becoming more real for him and he was realizing how his life was going to change in a very significant way. So he was opening up, and like I said, for me, at that particular moment, it became a very, uh, a very real uh, moment. Uh, the surgery was really uh, uneventful, not really much to report. I've been told, obviously I can't speak from a personal experience, but that childbirth is much more painful. So I still can't say to my wife, I know what you went through, so don't. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, it wasn't really a big deal. It wasn't a big deal if you can handle a little pain. Um, I was out of the hospital in a few days and completely back to myself within, uh, within several weeks. Um, so thoughts that sort of would surface afterwards and questions that I, I would ask myself. Um, would I do it again? Well, the answer is, of course not, because I can't. But if I could, would I do it again? And the answer is yes. One of the things that I had heard from people, um, and sometimes you don't like repeating things that you've heard other people say, especially when it seems very personal. But I, I find that I, I can't avoid the thought, so I'm going to say it anyway. And that is, people have said, do you have any regrets? And the answer is, yeah, I do have a regret. And the great, greatest regret I feel is that I, I can't do it again. And it's a feeling of great frustration. Uh, over the past year, I've met many other people who are in the process of donating the kidney and, you know, facilitated mostly through an organization called Renewal. Uh, recently, somebody in my shul donated a kidney a couple weeks ago. And my conversations with them uh, beforehand and during and after so I, I have to tell you, and it sounds a little strange, but I really, really felt very jealous in a sense that they were having the opportunity to, to, to experience that which I found to be very rewarding, uh, but, but I was unable to obviously have the opportunity to do this twice. Um, I, I learned many new things throughout this entire process. Uh, the first thing that I learned is that um, many, many people in the world suffer and struggle with things that we're not aware of. Now, as a rabbi, as you probably imagine, I see lots of things. I see people who struggle with all different sorts of problems and issues. For some reason, um, my personal experience with the realities of, of kidney <coughs> failure and kidney disease have been very limited. Um, I know and I've visited people from time to time who needed dialysis temporarily, but my exposure was very limited. And I did not appreciate, and I say this regretfully, how many people around me, in my community, um, and in the greater community, um, have lives that are very, very adversely affected by the fact that their kidneys don't function properly. I don't have statistics, uh, but there are, I have how many people in the country are on dialysis, but I do know that there are currently approximately 100,000 people in this country who are on a list to receive a kidney. So to give you a sense of how many people, now again, uh, there are 300 million people in the country, so you could argue that's a pretty small number, well, statistically, it may seem small, but the reality is that if you're living on the dialysis, which is a very, from what I understand, a very difficult life. It's a life in which um, you are tethered to a machine several times a week. Uh, it, the process can be very draining, very physically draining. Uh, the recovery uh, from the process it varies from person to person, can be very difficult. And you have no choice. You're limited in terms of your ability to be able to travel and to have a, a normal occupation and to be able to spend time with your family. And the worst part of the whole thing is it cannot be sustained long term. A person who is on dialysis, which means their kidneys are not functioning properly, can't live indefinitely like that. So again, there are certain people who are going to live several years and other people a few more than that. But unless someone in that situation uh, has a new kidney that is donated to them, so the life expectancy is pretty limited, which means that it's like a slow death. It's a slow death. This is one of the things that I learned through this entire experience. But, but like I said, I was sort of sheltered from it. And I'm amazed at how many people I've met since. People have come over to me, complete strangers, have introduced themselves to me and said, I just want you to know how much I appreciate what you did, okay? And they said, you know, I've been on the house for three years. I had no idea. I had no idea. So my eyes were opened in that regard. Another thing that I realized, which was shocking to me and very disappointing, was that the person who received my kidney would never have received a kidney in this country on the National Registry. He had been on the list, 
Uh, there are close, like I said, to 100,000 people waiting for a kidney in this country. Uh, there are certain algorithms that are used to determine uh, who is eligible and who takes precedence. You would think we apply the halachic principle of kol ha-kodem zocher, which means first come, first serve. But that's not the way it works. Uh, you come into a system, and there are all sorts of variables that are considered to determine whether or not you can receive a kidney. Well, as I mentioned to you, um, this individual has special needs. And in the 21st century U.S., the land of the free, the home of the brave, uh, you know, I'm proud to be an American. I don't mean to stand before you and say, you know, shame on us. But he would not be considered enough of a productive member of society, at least not to the extent that would warrant, um, you know, the same treatment as another. Now, I only discovered this afterwards. I had no idea. So my decision to donate to this individual was not a protest in any way. It was not to make a statement. It was not an attempt to share a certain agenda with the community. But I have to tell you, after the fact, I felt so incredibly gratified. Ashrenu atol chakenu, how fortunate we are that our tradition views all life as precious and, has, and having had infinite value and does not discriminate in that way. We do not look at a person and say, I'm really sorry, but your IQ is just doesn't make the cut. And so therefore, somebody else is going to come first. And for myself personally, like I said, even though that was not my kavana, the reason my kidney went to that individual is because his brother, as I told you, called me and said my brother needs a kidney. By the time I had been cleared for donation, I had said, I'll give it to anyone. But it just so happens I was on that track, and that's the way it, it, it continued. But I was shocked to learn, in retrospect, that he and I imagine others in his position will never ever get a kidney in this country unless someone steps up and say, I want to give my kidney to this person. And to me, like I said, that was really, that was an eye-opener. I also came to appreciate my own health in a way that I hadn't truly appreciated before. I'd like to tell you that I'm as inspired now as I was a year ago. Truthfully, I'm not sure I am. I will tell you that I have introduced certain changes in my, life, my own lifestyle, which I'm proud of. Uh, my daughter can tell you that when was the last time I had a diet drink, Shira? Come on. It's been since January. Come on, clap for me. I used, to, I used to drink about two, literally two to three liters of diet soda a day. That's what I, you know, that was my, that was my fuel. And um, I decided that if I'm going to give my kidney to someone, I should at least clean it out beforehand, right? I should, I should try to get, I couldn't make up for 40 years of, of poor eating habits, but I might as well just go ahead. So I said beforehand, and I felt so different. And I introduced other stages of my lifestyle. So good. In that sense, there's an awareness. Uh, for several weeks and maybe months after the, the surgery, the bracha of Ashayatza was very different for me. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, it takes an effort to be able to remain as focused on things like that all the time. But if I stop now and I think about it, it's amazing. My daughter is going to kill me for saying what I'm going to say to you right now. But I'm going to say it anyway. Maybe, forgive me if it's, I don't think it's inappropriate. Forgive me if it's, it's something you didn't really want to hear. One of the one of the tests that they do for you, uh, that they require you to do, rather, when you're being screened for a kidney donation, is they, re they require you to give a urine sample. Now, not just a small one like most people have experienced with time when you go to the doctor, but that you have to give what's called a 24-hour which, sample, which means that all the urine that you produce in one day has to be collected and given over. So, okay, I, I, we're not going to go through the details of how you manage that on a busy day. But the fact of the matter is, I had no idea. I had never given any moment of thought and consideration in my life as to how that part of my body works. You know, it's incredible. You know, you just drink and you go and you drink and go, you make an ashiyatsu, you come get, you don't, you don't really stop for a moment and think about how amazing it is, the way our body is, is, is built to filter itself. And when, when you actually stop and literally do a cheshbon, that's what it is, a calculation, and then examine, and, and tests are done. And, 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 oh, you're giving the all clear, knowing that so many other people wouldn't necessarily make that. I felt a tremendous amount of, of Akar Satov and appreciation, not just for my own health, but to realize and appreciate how amazing, how amazing our bodies are. I'm going to tell you an amazing thought. There was once a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Yezu Gordon, who was a Rosh Hashiva that tells Yeshiva, and he once went around collecting money, as many Rosh Hashiva have to do, collect money for his Yeshiva. So he came to a certain individual, who was a very wealthy individual, and he said, I would like a very, very nice donation from you. I guess he was a little aggressive. I'm not such an aggressive fundraiser, but this, Rebbe Les Gordon was very pushy. And he said, and he told him how much he wants. 
I don't know how much, I'll throw out a number. He says, I want $100,000 from you. So the guy looked at him and said, Rabbi, with all due respect, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's such an honor to have you here, and I'm happy to help you, Yeshiva, but $100,000, do you know how much that is? I, I consider giving you ten. You know, maybe, 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 since you're so special, twenty. but $100,000? Well, come on, you, that, that takes real chutzpah to come in here and tell me you want $100,000. So Rabbi Gordon says, I want to ask you a question. He says, in the Torah it says that when a person has animals, they're supposed to take miser, a tenth, as you know, a tenth of their animals, and they go as a, as a donation, right? It's like the concept of giving tzedakah. It's called miser behem. He says, do you know the process of selection, how that selection is done? So he says, yeah, I, I think I remember. So it's actually a Mishnah. It's in a Seth of Achoros. I forgot what parak you forgive me. But the Mishnah describes the following. You take all the animals that you have in one big area, one corral, one pen, and you open up a little, little Pesach, a little opening. And what happens is you start escorting the sheep through, one at a time. Right? Like we say, uh, Chazal tell us metaphorically that what happens to us with Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, they come through one at a time. And what happens, you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And what happens with the tenth? So that's exactly right. They take a little, like a little paintbrush with, with red, red mark and strike the back of the animal, I raise the miser, and that animal is separated. And then you continue again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I raise the miser. That's the way it's done. So Rabbi Gordon said to this philanthropist, let me ask you, he says, the Torah, of course, is, is not interested in wasting our time. The Torah is all about efficiency. Why would the Torah demand that we go ahead and count our animals in such an inefficient way? Doesn't it make more sense just count how many animals have and do a simple calculation? I know you guys are all smart. Okay, let's do it together. If, let's say, you have 100 sheep and you have to take 10%, how many is that? Look at that. It's amazing. And look how much side time we saved ourselves. If we would have gone one, two... We'd be here for 20 minutes. Why do it that way? So he says, I don't know. <laughs> Rabbi Gordon says, I'll tell you why. And I'm telling you right now, when I heard this, the, the, you know, this thought really did change my life. I, like I said, I wish it changed my life every moment, it doesn't. But this is one of those thoughts that, that really, really made a big difference on the way I think about everything. He said, I'll tell you why. Because when God says to you, give me 10% of what you have, a person's first reaction is, whoa, whoa that's a chutzpah. This is, this is my money. I worked hard for this. I go to work. I work hard. Don't stick your hand in my pockets. If I want, I'll give you a little bit, but don't ask me for 10%. So Hashem's a little smarter than us. He says, okay, here's how we're going to do it. Watch. Bring all your stuff together. All your money. Now let's do it together. One is for me. Two is for me. Three is for me. Four for me. Five for me. Six for me. Seven for me. Eight for me. Nine for me. The tenth, I'll give to you, God. And I will start all over again. You see how different that is? You see what an amazing perspective that is? This is all for me. All for me. And I'm being asked to give so little. You know what? Maybe I should give more. I feel bad giving only 10%. It's all a matter of perspective. And what I realized, and what I felt, when I realized that I would be able to donate my kidney, and again, this is, my, this is a personal thing for myself, I felt here was a way, a tangible way, that I can sort of quantifiably siphon off a part of my own health and share it with someone else. How do you, how do you share health? I don't know. It's, you know it, it's a hard thing to give to someone else. You know, we could learn how to be helpful to other people. We could learn uh, CPR, and we can uh, certainly donate in blood, which is a much less, you know, uh, a much less a controversial thing. So, okay, that, that's a very tangible way. But there's a limited number of ways that we can actually take a blessing of health and give it to someone else. And I found this to be something that would work for me. I want to reiterate, as I said before, that I do not think that anybody should ever be persuaded to donate a kidney. I think it's important to be people to be persuaded to become educated and to learn about it, to understand the risks, the benefits, uh, the short-term, long-term risks. Um, as I told you before, I'm not a risk taker. I'm not the kind of person who does things that would jeopardize my, uh, my life, my well-being in any way. And I can assure you that I found the risks to be so, so minimal for myself that I felt that this was something that was essentially risk-free for myself. But, you know, people have to come to that decision uh, on, on their own. Anybody taking a bio here? Maybe AP bio? Okay, good. So I'm not going to test you on the, the, what, the func what the function of the kidney is, but I'll ask you an easier question. You know, why, why do we have an appendix? Does anybody know why we have an appendix? 
Okay. So thankfully I can't hear what you're saying. So what I think you're saying is, we don't know. As far as we know, maybe it's some vestige of the past, right? Maybe, you know, early on in the evolutionary process of man. So it serves some function. We don't know why we have an appendix. Now, I have not studied bio, bio since uh, 11th grade. Uh, or 12th grade, rather. AP bio. That was my last time. So I don't know. Maybe since then we've discovered what an appendix does. But when I was in high school, we didn't know what an appendix does. And I don't think we still don't really know. Hashem created us with two kidneys. I'd like to think, maybe I'm wrong, but the reason why he gave us two kidneys is because some people, and again, we, thankfully not everybody needs to, not everybody can, and everybody needs to. Again, looking in this country, 300 million people, 100,000 people need you to do the math. I mean, there's still plenty, plenty of kidneys to go around. But I like to think that one of the reasons why Hashem gave us two kidneys is to allow uh, for this, for when it's appropriate. It may sound a little strange, and that logic may not be so compelling to everyone here, and I completely respect that. But I really think that HaKadosh Baruch has created us in many ways that enable us to share of ourselves with others. Sometimes it's easier than others, sometimes we have to be a little creative. Uh, we can share of ourselves in ways that are much less um, intrusive, but certainly must, much less uh, permanent than that. And that's also great. But, you know, it occurred to me that maybe, maybe, maybe this is the reason why uh, we have uh, two kidneys. There's another point that I want to make, and this really relates to the title. Because I was asked to submit a title today, and I, uh, if I remember correctly, I titled today's lecture, 21st Century Heroes, Real and Imagined. Now I'm going to tell you another interesting development uh, after I donated the kidney, and that is that for the first time in my life, people were calling me a hero. Now, they've stopped, so whatever. Nobody calls me a hero anymore. It didn't last that long. But there were some moments which were like very, very strange. Uh, there were a couple of occasions where I was walking down the street, um, and people that I've never seen before, I didn't know, came over to me, and they said to me, wow. And there was a mother I remember who said to her son, just shake, shake this man's hand. He's a real modern-day hero. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. When people call you a hero like that, oh, that's very nice. That, that actually makes, makes you feel good. Okay, very nice. I don't have Facebook. Um, that's one of the reasons someone asked, one, uh, or Prince asked me if we could, po oh, no, I'm sorry, Ms. Zenith said, can I post your uh, picture on Facebook? So I said, no problem, because I don't have Facebook. So I wouldn't know if you did or you didn't. So no problem, you're welcome to post me. I don't have Facebook. In the hours after the surgery, when word got out and people heard, so my kids were telling me how impressed they were with how many likes I was getting. I, if I remember correctly, I actually exceeded 1,000 within a minute. Let me know, anybody here ever exceeded 1,000 likes in one minute? No? You look at that. Okay, so <laughs> today, if they would put my name up there, nobody would know who I am. But okay, so I had my moment of fame. Now I'm going to tell you, I gave some thought to that, some serious thought. Why is it that people look at something like this and they say you're a hero? Because I know myself, and I'm not a hero. I know, I know myself. I, I know people who are heroes. I've met heroes. I know people who are heroic. I know I'm not one of them. So why is it that everybody looks at this and they say this is heroic? So I, I'd like to suggest the following. That there are two sort of modes of life. And this applies to every area of life. And it's very, very important to realize this and appreciate this because it affects everything about our life. There is one thing that's called process and there's something else that's called result. Right? There are, there are people who are very result or goal-oriented people and people who are process-oriented. Our world, the world that we live in right now, I'm not sure it's always been this way, but is a very goal-oriented society, which means that people are interested in what they call the bottom line. We know what the bottom line is? What could you show for your effort? What have you accomplished? Let's see. You know, show me your portfolio. How much money have you made? Right? How many patients have you treated? That's all I want to know. I'm not interested in what it took to get you to that point. I don't really care about how much time you've spent studying and researching and learning. I don't really care about how many failures you've had. I want to know, bottom line, what are the results? What have you produced? And as a result, our society seeks greater efficiency and is interested in output. That's why a lot of people are losing their jobs to machines. And it's only going to get worse. I don't know if you follow the news at all. You know what's going on right now? A lot of people are fighting for what? Higher wages. So they shouldn't get paid seven, eight, nine dollars an hour. They should get paid, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen dollars an hour. Okay, that seems very reasonable, right? The problem is, 
The industry is saying, okay, well, if it's going to cost $15 an hour to pay, you know what? I'd rather replace you with a machine. So they're saying already, it's been tested, whether it's uh, Wendy's, or, or McDonald's, or Burger King, all these stuff, they're, they're testing it already, where you go ahead and you speak to a machine, you tell the machine what you want, the machine produces it, the machine, and they'll pay one guy as a security guard to make sure nobody's stealing all the hamburgers. Otherwise, the whole thing is automated. You're sure you've heard of 3D printing. 3D printing is all about the same thing. In fact, they even talk about 3D printing kidneys one day. I'm sure it'll happen. 3D printing is all about the same thing. It's why should we have people going ahead and, and, and wasting time and resources figuring out, let's just fit, make the machine that will do it all for us. Because all we are interested in is the bottom line. And we are all affected by this. Every one of us. You have grown up uh, in an automated world. Uh, I have the benefit. And I, I wish I was young as you, but in this respect, I'm, I'm, I'm not envious of you. Because I, like your teachers, remember a day when actually we were not wired and connected to the world at all time, and it puts us at somewhat of a disservice. My own kids, well, she would probably remember. She, that's your last time I'm going to mention your name, don't worry. She would probably remember the VHS, um, you know, uh, what do they call those, like the tapes you used to stick in the VCR. I remember when my son is now 14, when we watched playing a video for him, we didn't have the DVD version, so we had to rewind it, and he started throwing a fit. He started, what are you doing? What does rewind mean? And I didn't even know how to explain it to him. I'm like, well, you know, because he'd never seen one of these things before. I'm like, just get it, give it a couple minutes. He says, why do you have to give a minute? Because DVDs don't have to be rewound. Well, nobody knows what a DVD anymore is, right? Nobody, nobody uses those anymore. Uh, my, my youngest, Shira, who's six and a half, I'm sorry, Essie, who's six and a half years old. <laughs> so we were playing a game with her a few years ago. And we were actually playing a game with each other and she wanted to play. It wasn't really for a uh, three or four year old, but it was basically you got this little pet deck which had this little saying and you had to, uh, you started it and I guess the other person had to finish the sentence. So she got one and it said, if at first you don't succeed, so what's the, what's the conclusion? Try again. Try again. Exactly. Good. Well, she didn't know that. She needed a little help. So she said, you know, what does mine say? So I said, if first you don't succeed, which she said, what succeeds? Well, like, like, if you try something and it doesn't work the first time, what should you do? So you know what she said? Charge it. <laughs> okay, so for, for a three or four year old, that, that's, that's the world we live in. If you first you don't succeed, recharge. There's no charge, there's no try again. Because we are very goal oriented. Getting to the end. And it's affecting us in many ways. And it affects our Avodah Hashem as well. Many of us don't have patience to learn the way we are supposed to learn. We don't have patience to dive in the way we are supposed to dive in because we just really, really want to get to the end. It's about the bottom line. What have you done? And it occurred to me that one of the reasons why many people perhaps are so impressed with somebody who donates the kidney is because they look at that and they say, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing what you did. Now, for the sake of all the other kidney donors out there, I'm not going to stand in front of you and say, yeah, it's not a big deal, it's silly, it's narcotic, why are you giving it any attention? Fine, granted, but I'm going to tell you what impresses me a lot more. Maybe it's just me. What impresses me a lot more is people who can demonstrate consistency every single day of their life to doing the right thing, to pushing themselves to do the right thing. Not only one moment where they make a big splash. Now, I said about my wife, this was actually a good line, Pat myself I said about my wife, people said afterwards, you know, you're a hero. So I said, my wife's a hero. I gave my kidney once. She gives her kishkas every day. Yeah. Right? So it's cute, right? But it's true. It's true. I, 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 I look at her and I say, how does she find the strength, the energy to continue constantly give and give and give and give to people? So my message to you strangely, actually, is that people who donate their kidneys are not necessarily the biggest heroes in the world. The biggest heroes in the world are people who I can always, or usually, push themselves to do the right thing. And it's not necessarily going to be quite as glamorous, and it won't necessarily be, ooh ah, not necessarily a thousand uh, likes on Facebook, but without a doubt, ultimately, that is what is most impressive in life. People who can watch, demonstrate consistency every day. You know, the Akedas Yitzchak was a test for, test for who? Avram Yitzchak. Avram. That's what most people say. We always talk about Avram. But the obvious question, which some ask, is, wait a second. With all due respect to Avram, he wasn't the one who was going to have his 
you forgive me, his uh, throat slit, right? he, he, he was going to walk away. Yitzchak was the one who was going to be slaughtered. So why is it that it's called a test for Avram? It's a test for Yitzchak. And you know what one of the answers is? Because for Avram, excuse me, for Yitzchak rather, the test is over in an instant. He does it, he goes under the knife, and that's it. He goes down all of history as being the greatest hero ever. Avram Avinu has to live with the ongoing test of the Akedah for every day. I mean, thankfully, again, we know in the end it didn't come to it. But he was prepared to commit himself in that way. It wouldn't have ended for him. The struggle would have only started after the Akedah. I want to say one other point, and I'll open the floor if you have any questions. This is an amazing, amazing, amazing thought. And I don't even know who to give this credit to, because I heard this once and I don't remember in whose name. But it's an amazing idea. You know, Chazal tell us we can learn a lot about prayer, a lot about tefillah from certain individuals in the Torah and Tanakh. Some of the most famous examples, of course, Chana. We learn many of the halachos from, of tefillah from, from Chana. The Gemara Brachos teaches that we learn many things from her. And some of the other great tefillah giants of history, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who instituted, as we know, um, you know, Shachos, and Chamariv, and all the Himos, and so many people who doubt in wonderful. Some of the most important, relevant, daily laws of davening come from two specific prayers in the Torah. The first one we just read several weeks ago about Avram Avinu, who the Torah tells us, what did Avram do? He prayed on behalf of Sodom. And based on that encounter, Chazal the Gemara Brachos tells us, first of all, we learn from there the import, that, that we daven Tefillah Shachos. Number two, we learn from there the importance of Makam Kavua, that a person should always daven in the same place. Other halachos that we learn from there. The format of davening, every single davening, 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 starts with praise, and, right, bakasha, excuse me, shabach, and then bakasha, and then requests of Hashem, and then hadav. Where does that format come from, that structure? It comes from Moshe Rabbeinu, where at the end of his life, the Torah tells us in Pashas Veschanan, starts off by praising Hashem, and then making his request, his petition, and the Gemara captures that and says, that is the way we should daven. Now, here comes the punchline. Just listen to this. This is amazing. You guys have been great. Just listen to this. You know what's amazing about those two examples? Maybe somebody sees it coming. I'll let you say it. You know what's amazing? The Chazal look at those two tefillos, the tefillos of Avram and Moshe, and say these are the best examples of prayer. You know what's amazing? You're going to fall off your seat when you hear it. What you say? They're different. They're different. Well, they are different. Why, why are they different? You want to know? Get ready. It didn't work. Their prayers were not answered. Avram prayed to save Sodom, and get, what did Hashem say? No. no. Moshe prayed to be able to go into Eretz Israel, and what did Hashem say? No. And we look at those tefillos and we say, this is an amazing tefillah. This is a great prayer. This we can all learn from. You know what Chazal are telling us? They're telling us that in life, the most important things that we can do, are the things that we can do. What we accomplish, what comes out of our actions, whether we are successful or not, how the world measures success and failure, we don't know. But the most important thing is that we try, we put in our effort. And I really, really think that the praise, that uh, I, can't, I can't say this without sounding in some strange way that I'm actually complimenting myself, but it's not what I'm trying to do. I really think that the descriptions of somebody who donates a kidney as being truly heroic, I think that they're exaggerated and I think they're misplaced. Because at the end of the day, people can sometimes bring themselves to do truly great things, and then they're over. I made that decision, I committed to it, there's no turning back for me. But people who can commit themselves to doing the right things, to giving of themselves, not necessarily by having themselves cut open, but by giving themselves in other ways which are just as meaningful every single day, even when it's challenging, even when I don't have the time, even when it's difficult, to committing myself to the process, not just to the goal, not to the end result, so I think that's really extraordinary. That's heroic. That's ultimately what shows a person's true commitment over time. And so therefore, I'll leave you with a bracha. My bracha is to you, that each and every one of you, at the right time, as I told you, I think you should learn about kidney donation and understand why it's right or not right for you. Just so you know, I do not believe that the law allows anybody to donate a kidney altruistically until 21 years old. So unless you're a teacher in the room, um, you know, at this point, it would just be purely for the purpose of learning about it because you'd be too young to be able to act on it anyway. But it's never too, too soon to learn and to understand and to appreciate what's involved, but at the same time to understand and appreciate 
that whether a person gives their kidney or not, real opportunities, tangible opportunities, are presented to us each and every day to do the right thing. To give to others, to give of ourselves. And for this, it doesn't require, it's not so controversial, it doesn't require um, you know, being screened beforehand. You don't have to be in best physical health to be able to go ahead and make such a commitment. It just means being able to what? To do the right thing. To be there for other people. And that's my bracha to you. That you should be inspired, uh, not by me, but you should be inspired from yourselves to be able to always make proper, responsible decisions and hopefully always learn to give it yourselves, which of course is in some way the most important message of any Sutta Sada. And that is that I have been the recipient of good, and now I have to try to take that feeling of gratification, of appreciation that I feel, and give towards others.